Once upon a time, there were browsers and they were at war. And they were fighting about client-side feature, about server-side features. They couldn't do much, so they decided more client-side power. They came up with JavaScript, their knight Brendan Eich at Netscape in only 10 days. But all was not good because the whole point was to separate the different sites. You didn't want your local brewery to attack the king's treasure, so they developed the same origin policy. But scripts and JSONP don't fall under the same strict, same origin policy and can be included cross domain. And that is why we have cross site script inclusion, and that was the tale of a fameless but widespread vulnerability. My name is Veit Halperin. Uh, I work at Skip. You can find me on Twitter. We do security on the defensive side, on the offensive side. I'm the one who's in the offensive side, doing auditing and uh, research, uh, looking for new attack vectors, new attack types. Oh, that was not what you were interested about. All right. So cross-site script inclusion, if it was too fast, let's go through it real quickly, not slowly. Quick, slow. Yeah? No? Yeah, some, someone's having fun. <laughs> That's good. Well, basically, you don't want cross-origin leakage. You don't want one website to get to the contents of another site. That's what the same origin policy does. It's defined as port, protocol, and domain name which, at least for most browsers, Internet Explorer has uh, an exception. They think ports are not important, uh, which, of course, um, has their own security implications. But generally, that's how the same origin policy works. You just say, like, if you are on that site, you can access only those that are in your same origin. Now, with scripts, that's just a little different. If, and uh, this is how the cross-site script inclusion then works is basically a malicious site can include a script from any site it wants and then can access all the data that is inside that script. You might ask yourself, what's the big fuss about this? Isn't that supposed to work exactly like that? Uh, and yes, it is. Uh, it's one of the moments when JavaScript's actually doing what it's supposed to be. Um, the big fuzz is that people forget that you can include scripts cross-site. And then they put sensitive data inside those scripts. And the moment sensitive data is inside scripts, then that's when cross-site script inclusion kicks in and it's the fun starts. Um, you might be surprised what you find in uh, script files once you start reading them, actually. Um, unimportant things like private keys you know, credit card data. It's, it, it is quite amazing. But this is, it gets more interesting when you get to ambient authority. So ambient authority is a word we don't toss around that often, but basically it's a global state that you keep on the client to make sure you know that you're logged in cookies, in a less fancy word, uh, are one example of that. But there's different ambient authority, and all of those ambient authorities basically work on cross-site script inclusion. Um, and if you've ever, I, I don't know, who's, who's a pen tester here? Who does pen testing? OK. I wonder what the rest is doing. <laughs> it's not that many. OK, so cross-site cross -site request forgery, quickly, is like when you execute uh, actions in uh, the context of a user that's logged in from a different site. But that's when you go like, post, do something there. And that works because the cookie jar is global, right? Um, and the same if you include stuff from a different site. It will also include these ambient authority information. And if you go like, hey, give me that script file from yourbank.com, and you're logged in in your bank.com, it will send the cookies along. So if it is different, what's inside that script based on your login, 
then you'll get more information. And um, the leaks get more interesting because usually there is user-relevant data on those, in those script files. People just kind of tend to forget uh, that those scripts, even if they're in an environment where you're authenticated, uh, can be included. It, it doesn't really change anything. So uh, you find CSRF tokens, you find user-relevant data, uh, and I think it's time to look just as, at an example. Uh, some of the stuff is uh, blurred out, uh, and that is because I never really reported this one, uh, because the site has bigger problems than cross-site script inclusion, and I think if I would send it to them, they'd be like, what do we care? Um, also, it's nice to have something to test on. Uh, and uh, this site is Alexa top 150. It's in that range. So just so you know, this is not just your local brewery. This is, this is a site that has quite a lot of users. So I have to confront. Uh, let's see what data we have. So uh, there we go. So yeah, I saw in a pen test this is happening. There is apparently a JSON callback, and the function is just passed from the parameter. That sounds good. And then we've got the email. Uh, we've got first name, last name, phone number, username. But we also got date of birth. Uh, we've got very good location data, very exact. Uh, so that's our office at the moment uh, for for those wanting to copy, it's not that interesting. I can tell you anyway. But uh, for an attack, this is quite relevant. You can locate users quite exact. Uh, they'll probably want to know where, it, how the weather is at their home or uh, their uh, emails when they're checked in or whatever site it is. Basically, you know where they're at. And this is as complicated as the attack gets. Um, we'll start from the bottom. Uh, we have a script. We include the resource. We give it our own JSONP callback, the function we define ourselves. It's just a JavaScript. And the function that we define, the data it gets, it's just basically an alert on the stringified version of the data. The data was JSON, so this is, e this is how easy it is. It, it feels a little bit like it's too easy, but no, this, this, is, this is how complicated it is. Um, and these vulnerabilities, they're actually, yeah, quite widespread. There, was a, there is one that's documented about Zendesk, and Twitter had a Zendesk account, and you could get all sorts of information about Twitter users through their Zendesk's XSSI. Uh, there was the first one I think that's documented is about Gmail and their address book, Jeremiah Grossman, for those that uh, maybe that rings a bell for some of the pen testers. Uh, he, he found a cross-site script inclusion where they, he could basically read the whole address book the same way, as simple as that. And um, yeah, yay for leakages. Yeah, I did say famous. Thanks for asking. Uh, the cross-site script inclusion, basically, it's been around for a while, um, basically since JavaScript and same origin policy were born. Um, but I think Jeremiah Grossman's attack was in 2006, so it has its 10-year anniversary this year. Um, if you look in the de facto standard of web security, the OWASP, um, it's not in the top 10, uh, it's apparently not widespread enough, but actually if you look and search on the OWASP site, uh, you won't find cross-site script inclusion at all. If you use Google to search on OWASP, you'll find two papers. Um, but basically, if we want to eradicate a vulnerability or if we want to find a vulnerability and want to reduce the impact of it, people need to know about this, and right now it's, it's, it's not known. It really isn't. And it lacks a few other features. One of them is there is no categorization. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, there's XSSI. And then like, 
whoever uses it in that context just like adapts it the way he needs it. Um, and so, yeah, it's missing like a structure like XSS, where you have reflected, stored, universal, mutation-based, all that fun stuff. Yeah, that's kind of still missing. And talking about the widespread parts, to quote Sebastian Lickes from his paper, The Unexpected Dangers of Dynamic JavaScript, we observed that a third of the surveyed sites utilize dynamic JavaScript. More than 80% of the sites are susceptible, susceptible to attacks via remote script inclusion. And he is talking only about dynamic JavaScript. And we'll see in a second that that is only one of the categories there is. So let's start by categorizing the cross-site script inclusions. Um, I've come up with four categories uh, that I think are kind of handy to deal with. First, we've got static script and JSONP. Of course, if you have JSONP, you have to know all the parameters. Uh, if there's in the request stuff you don't know, it, it won't work. Um, but basically, static JavaScript, you have a file somewhere lying around, publicly accessible, and it has a private key for whatever reason. But it does happen, apparently. I've seen it. Then category number two, static JavaScript requiring authentication. So basically, that's a file that's only accessible once you're logged in, and it throws you an error or something else when you're logged out. And from that one, if there's no sensitive data in this file, there's one information you can always gather from it, and that's a login oracle. You will always know if a user's logged in with authentic authentication-based JavaScript cross-site script inclusion. Then category number three, dynamic JavaScript. Dynamic JavaScript, um, as with the others, doesn't have to be bad. I mean, there is a, there's plenty of dynamic JavaScript around. One is uh, for just keeping time. Um, there's timestamps that I've seen, just like regularly updated in JavaScript files. Uh, of course, advertisement is one of those big things that keeps changing the JavaScript files. Um, but sometimes it also has user data, and uh, like the, the one we saw before. And yeah, so Caesar have tokens. And then the fourth one is non-script. Non-script uh, cross-site script inclusions is kind of like a contradiction because it's cross-site script inclusion. Um, but it's basically, it, it works the same way. You include something, um, and the browser thinks it is a script. And the moment it handles it that way, you can leak uh, data like comma-separated values, or, and then it thinks, oh, I think those are identifiers. The JavaScript code doesn't work, but I think those are identifiers. We should try, well, I'll give an error handler out, and once there's an error handler, I can read the data. So we can leak actual data through uh, the script inclusion, despite it not being script at all. But those attacks, they're all browser problems. And they are not generic, and they're usually being fixed, usually. Let's talk about finding cross-site script inclusion vulnerabilities. If you want to find the category number one, there is really no way around it. You will have to read the code. Um, as, as much as that is annoying, it is also quite a good learning experience. Um, sometimes it's, it's surprising what you will find. Uh, I can only recommend it. Uh, for certain things, you can, of course, grab. Uh, you can grab for private keys. You can grab for social security numbers. You can grab for credit card numbers. And if you're using Burp Suite while you're testing, it will actually help you on those ones as well already. If it thinks there's sensitive data inside a script file, it will be like, I, I think there's something. So now that you know that there is cross-site script inclusion, you can just take that data from all the users. Finding cross-site script inclusion number two and three is a little bit more tricky, but not that much. I mean, the diagram fits on one page. So basically, we're assuming the following situation. We're assuming that you are browsing the app as authenticated user, and you found that there are JavaScript files or callbacks. Or, and um, then you re-request the JavaScript file without authentication and check if the response is a script. 
And it, if it is, is no script, what you found is a script that works with authentication. So, goal. If it does, uh, if it is a script, then you should check if it's uh, different from the original. If it's different from the original, uh, if it's not different from the original, we'll start with that one. Script's not, uh, sc script's not dynamic, uh, there's nothing of interest. But if it is different, uh, we'll re-request the JavaScript file again uh, and check if it differs again. If it doesn't differ again, so I, I'm not sure if you follow the line, you've had it once authenticated, you've had it once unauthenticated, and now you've had it again unauthenticated. If the last two match up, you've got dynamic JavaScript based on authentication. And in the other case, it's probably just generically dynamic and you can discard it. And then there is um, category number four and I want to show one example that I thought was quite funny. It's from 2011. Gareth Hayes uh, published that one. And uh, I'm gonna use my pointer. So you see there is JSON uh, as a server response. And you can obviously provide the data on the friend. And the user can obviously provide the data on the email. And we see here is a UTF-7 encoded payload, which translates to colon, hochkomma, hochkomma, whatever that is in English. Uh, curly braces, square brackets, and semicolon. And that is basically an escape from JSON, and that is something that you don't see very often. It should be impossible. And then there is an alert, may the force be with you, and it keeps going. So we injected JavaScript into JSON. We broke out of JSON, which is, yeah, this is something you don't think about usually when you're a developer, and that is only possible um, because this one can be the beginning. This is valid JavaScript start. If your JSON files start with curly braces, this is not possible. If it starts with this character, it is possible. So now on the malicious side, um, you just include the JSON file, and then you tell them, go with the char site UTF-7. And it worked. But that was in 2011, so it, you would assume every browser has fixed it, and most serious browsers have. But I'm here to tell you this still works in Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. Yes. So uh, um, I'm going to get to something later, but somebody in the tool like to find XSSI, somebody so, like, gave a, um, a pull request on GitHub, and he wanted to exclude this character. Like, he obviously doesn't know that this one actually works. Um, so, it seems to be a no fix. So, go ahead and have fun with this in your pen tests. If you want to break out of JSON, this will work at least in Internet Explorer and Edge. Yeah, let's talk about exploiting cross-site script inclusion. Because um, there is a couple of different ways, depending on the situation. Uh, I'm definitely no JavaScript hero, so uh, it helps me to think about this a little bit. Uh, first case, if it's a global variable. So we've got, guess wh where that example came from. <laughs> I've, I've not mentioned this before, not at all. Um, this, by the way, this is also, uh, the, the key has changed, but this didn't get fixed somehow. I did report this one. Uh, it did not get fixed. Uh, this is a static JavaScript file unauthenticated, it's just out there. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, global variable on a server, you include it, uh, I've let the host away, but of course you can, it's lying on somebody else's host, and then you can just alert, you just can go ahead. This, this will be in your uh, scope, so you can access it. Second case, uh, function override. Um, so if we see a response that has 
a function attached to some data, we can start by uh, overriding a function and then have a subfunction and a sub subfunction and basically then go leaked and alert again what you have. And this is how the site like was called anyway, so that was their callback. But this example, I took this example because when I started this, I, I didn't immediately catch that it was a JSONP callback. Of course, it's a lot easier. It's the example we've seen before. Um, you can provide your own callback. You don't have to overwrite the function. But sometimes it's not a callback. It's just a JavaScript file. You need to overwrite it, and you can. And then there's prototype tampering. And um, prototype tampering is something that has changed a bit over the, this course of time. Let's just look at this example first, and then we'll say what the restrictions are nowadays. Uh, so we have a self-executing function. Where is my pointer? We have a self-executing function. There's an array in there. And of course, you can't access that array from a self-executing function right away. But that array is parsed with uh, the slice function of the array type. And we can, what we can do on our side is we can overwrite the slice function. This is, uh, this is one of the nice things about JavaScript. You can just overwrite most of it while it's running. And uh, we'll just say, all right, we'll have a new function, and we'll create a function that will send the data back to the attacker. Back a few years, it was still possible to overwrite the array constructor. So the example we saw before, uh, It's only a matter of time. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this one was this here. It's, it's basically if you have it in, uh, in square brackets, you could just say the array is not an array. And then you could just leak all the data inside. That was, uh, that was quite fun. But they fixed that one. Fortunately for security, unfortunately for pen testers. Um, and the restrictions are being imposed more and more, but it's, it's always worth trying to overwrite constructors. It's always worth uh, getting a, a direct access. Um, this is basically how you work at it. And then we already get to, uh, we already get to preventing cross-site script inclusion. Their easiest way is for developers is just to never put sensitive data into JavaScript files. Just keep them out there. They, they don't belong into JavaScript files. JavaScript files, by design, are made to be accessible across sites. And if they're sensitive data, it's going to be leaked. It's as easy as that. But sometimes, I guess, it's handy. So there's a couple of other things that help. Set a correct content type. Um, so that UTF-7 attacks also don't work on other browsers. Uh, same for the X-Content type options header, no sniff. It also helps in this one. If you do have an anti-cross-site request forgery token, it works the same way. I mean, uh, for the authentication-based cross-site script inclusion, of course, because we exploit the same behavior as in cross-site request forgery. So uh, that will stop it right there. Then the same site cookie attributes um, just popped into uh, Google Chrome's version 51 last week. Um, it's a new flag. It's a new uh, cookie attribute uh, that uh, you can set. Basically, if the only, only way it makes sense in this context for cross-site script inclusion, if you set it to strict, there is an option to set it to lax. Um, and then requests from other sites won't be able to access these scripts. Um, but there is no wide adoption for it, of course, yet. Uh, Google Chrome as far as, is the only one, as far as I know. Uh, it was Mike West from Google and Mark Goodwin from Mozilla, who wrote the, um, the RFC draft. Um, 
the RFC draft is from April, I think, so this, this, this is all fairly new. Um, and they say themselves in the RFC that you shouldn't rely on this solely. So um, also for cross-site request forgery. Um, but then, of course, uh, spread the word about them. Just like if you are a developer, uh, tell your buddies. Uh, if you are a hacker, uh, pen tester, bounty hunter, uh, exploit them and report them. Um, and I think one of the things that's very important uh, with vulnerabilities, especially with those that haven't gotten a lot of attention, is that uh, you want to make it easy, especially for new people, to find them. So uh, first, we're going to look into some more links before we get into the other thing that I was introducing to. Uh, I always like reads. I read a lot, and this is, this is where the money is. Most of this stuff I've been telling you about is not grown uh, at my place, but from all these other amazing guys. So the first one is Jeremiah Grossman's article when he uh, stole the uh, address book from Google. Then Jason is not as safe as people think. It's a very interesting uh, post by Joe Walker, who was also involved in the same site cookie uh, development, uh, even though he's not an author on the RFC. Uh, then the spanner, that's the JSON hijacking, that's the one that still works on Internet Explorer and Edge. Then the next one, FRAC, this is the latest issue. Uh, Jönsson has written that uh, post, uh, it's on Ruby, and uh, only one like tiny phrase relates to cross-site script inclusion, but basically Ruby, uh, and uh, he writes about Ruby version 3, uh, sometimes has the option that you can tell it by parameter what format you want back. So you can say format equals XML or format equals JSON, but you can also sometimes say format equals JavaScript. And, and usually it wasn't like taken away by default, so you could get access to the data without uh, basically doing anything. And maybe the application wasn't even using it, but it was just there. Then the next paper is a paper by Takeshi Terada, uh, and it's on identifier-based cross-site script inclusion. Yeah, it's cooling down a little bit with the rain. It's nice. Um, the identifier-based cross-site script inclusions are those that, uh, that we were talking about with, the, for example, the comma-separated values. He has some other really nice attacks in there. Most of them, uh, I think, have been fixed by now. Uh, but it's an interesting read. Then the next link goes to uh, Sebastian Lecky's paper, uh, the one we've quoted on from at least the widespread part. And um, this, is, this is the paper that prompted uh, me looking into it. It's, it's a good read. Uh, unfortunately, they never published their code. Um, uh, that happened, I guess, partially because they weren't too fond of it. I'm not sure if there's also uh, some usage rights in there because SAP was involved somewhere in that research. Then the next one is uh, the personal side of Sebastian, and it has some more uh, examples for leakages. Then the next one is the link, to, we're talking about this one now. This is the link that uh, went to uh, the Twitter Zendesk vulnerability that I've been talking about. Uh, that's uh, the write-up of that. And then, basically, the last one is on our blog. I see that the link is wrong. <laughs> so, it's not the year 20,116. Uh, it's the year 2016. There's one, one too many in there. Uh, it's good to fuck up your own links. Uh, yeah, that's basically the write-up of this talk. So, if you're, like, trying to get the information again, or you want to read it in a slower version, you'll find it all there. And to spread the love, uh, I wrote the, an extension for Burp that was supposed to make your life easier, finding this, those cross-site script inclusions. It implemented that little diagram that we've talked about. Uh, it's a passive scanner module, so if you've used Burp, just to let you know, it's a passive scanner module. If your passive scanner runs on everything, it will fire requests. Um, and that is because the active scanner module API of 
burp is not designed for what we're doing um, with, this, uh, with this extension. And uh, I've talked to them, and they were like, yeah, it's, you just have to go that way. So just if you use it, know about it. It's not a big deal. It just fires the request unauthenticated. But if you're testing anything on Google, it will log you out. And that's quite annoying. So then it does filter for JSONP and scripts at the moment. And if you look at the code about that, it's not only ugly because I can't program properly, but it's also ugly just because developers uh, use the wrong content types all the time and uh, deliver scripts back as application JSON um, and, and all sorts of stuff. That was before Burp improved their detection mechanism for uh, the content type. For right now, it's, it's still a bit messy, but maybe I'll take it out. Every time I've tried to like, make it more lean, all of a sudden I've had findings missing. So uh, yeah. It's already in your Burp store. Uh, later on, I'll commit a new version uh, to GitHub, which uh, the current version only checks generally uh, if there is dynamic JavaScript. And the new version that I'll push later on uh, will distinguish and have medium findings and low findings. And the low findings are those that are generically dynamic. So it filters out a little bit more for you. And you'll have less uh, false positives, I hope. When it comes to ambient authority, it's only currently implemented for cookies, but it's work in progress. So I'll will uh, implement further ones as time comes along. And if you want to, you can, of course, always contribute by sending pull requests. And if you send pull requests, I kindly ask you to make them small. Uh, I got one that was huge and changed all sorts of things. And uh, it was impossible to accept, unfortunately, even though the work was well intended. Um, but yeah. This is, I hope it's going to help you in the pen testing uh, for those that are developing and using Burp. I hope this is going to help too. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, shoot. All right, so we're going to have Jesper running around with the mic again. If you have any questions, just raise your hands, just like before. He's coming. Keep your boss waiting. Yeah. <laughs> to Jonas. Thank you. So the UTF-7 uh, trick, mm -hmm. uh, do you know if that's uh, in Internet Explorer by in the, you know, um, in the box? Or it's, it, uh, do you have to use uh, document comp compatibility mode? Please come again. I just acoustically didn't understand what you said. Oh, sorry. Uh, so is it in Internet Explorer out of the box? Yes. OK, thanks. Same as with Edge. Uh, I, I was, uh, I was uh, wondering if they, um, because I, I don't want to bash on purpose, because the programmers have a, do know a lot that I don't. But uh, Internet Explorer has proven to be bad over and over and over again. And um, so I thought maybe they had made a clear cut on that one. And in Edge, they wouldn't implement it. But even in Edge, it works. And I, I mean, theoretically, I guess there is no ticket open for Edge. I guess uh, Gareth um, did send it back for Internet Explorer. I didn't open a new one for this. Uh, yeah, it, it's just I think they consider it one of those things that's that's how it's supposed to work. So yeah, <laughs> just just enjoy and <laughs> exploit. Anyone else? All right, cool. Thank you so much, Fight.